week 10 of quarantine and this week i decided to become a virtual wine connoisseur and by that, I really mean that I taught my computer how to look at a bunch of different input factors of wine and come out with a classification, whether the wine was good, mediocre, or bad. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about the introductory machine learning techniques that I used to create this wine classifier. In the description below, you'll actually be able to find a link to the data that I used. And here, this data comes from the UCI Machine Learning Repository. Here, they have two different data sets. One is related to red wine and the other is white wine. Both of these types of wines are variants of the Portuguese Vinho Verde wine. I might have completely butchered that pronunciation. I don't know. I drink the $5 Trader Joe's wines. In these wines, we have a bunch of different attributes. We have things like acidity, sugar, chlorides, alcohol, density, pH, sulfur dioxide, and then we also have an output, which is our quality rating on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is really bad wine and 10 is really good wine. So I'm just going to go ahead and download these data sets and put them into a folder. All right, so now going into my directory, I'm going to start opening a Jupyter Notebook. But before you guys do that, remember to pip install all the requirements so that you can actually run the code that I'm giving you. All right, and then from there, let's type in our Jupyter Notebook command to open a Jupyter Notebook. Cool. So first, I'm just going to open this uh, white wine classification. And you'll notice at the very top, I'm just importing a bunch of different things. So here I'm importing pandas, numpy, and pie plot. And then at the bottom, this is just importing all the machine learning classifiers and tools that I'm gonna use when it comes to classifying the quality of wine. So the first thing we're gonna do, let's read in the data. And here, since we already have it in CSV format, I'm just gonna call pandas.readcsv and input the file name. You'll notice that I also have this delimiter here and that's just because in the CSV file, instead of commas, they use semicolons. And we can see the output of this data frame right here. So you'll notice that we have all these features that the online data set said that they would have, such as the acidity, citric acid, sugar, so on. And you'll notice that there's this quality rating over here. So let's just do some initial visual analysis. And what that means is I just want to see if there's anything that we can see visually between the factors such as, you know, alcohol level and the quality of the wine. For example, personally, I prefer the higher the alcohol, the better quality of the wine, but that's just a personal thing. All right, and here are the results of looking at that. You'll notice that there's not really that much of a pattern, maybe the pH, but these box and whisker plots kind of look like they're everywhere. All right, another thing we'll notice is that there are no wines that rate less than three or greater than nine. So the quality of the wines are all somewhere between three and nine. And you know, if you gave me just like a bunch of different numbers for each of these factors if you ask me to classify you know what that wine would come out to i would have absolutely no idea so that's where machine learning comes in and we're going to see if our classifiers can do a better job than we can all right first we're going to gather the training and the testing data so what that means is you have this entire data set somewhere around 5,000 different points and we want to keep part of it to train these classifiers because the whole principle of machine learning is that you input data into the computer and you give it the output label so that the computer can kind of learn from that data. When it sees new inputs, it'll be able to correctly determine the output of those new inputs. And here what we're going to do is split the data into training and testing data. The training data is going to be used to train the classifiers and then the testing data is going to be data that this computer is not going to see at all and we're going to use that to check whether our classifier is actually doing a good job or not. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to relabel my data and relabel the quality of my data. So you know the numbers 3 through 9 don't really mean much to us other than that 
three is probably not that great, and nine is probably pretty good. Instead, let's just map these to low, mediocre, or high quality wines. And for low, I'm gonna give that a value of zero. For mid, I'm gonna give that a value of one. And then for high, I'm gonna give that a value of two. So that's exactly what I'm doing in this cell right here. If we look at our data frame again, we'll notice that the quality is now zero, one, or two. So I'm gonna set our X values to be all the inputs except for the quality, and then the Y, our output, to be the quality. And here I'm just gonna standardize everything, um, and then I'm gonna produce my training and testing set variables using train test split. So basically here I'm just inputting a test size 0.2, which means that we're getting 80% training data, and then the remaining 20% will be our testing data. Here we can see that we have around 4,000 different values for our training set and around 1,000 for our testing set. So before we move on to the machine learning parts, let's talk about what exactly is a classifier. Basically a classifier in machine learning is exactly what it sounds like. It takes in some input data and tries to classify it into a certain class. Our different classes are low quality wine, mediocre quality wine, and then high quality wine. And it works something like this. So for an example, let's look at alcohol content and sweetness of a wine. Imagine that we have a bunch of different data points and each of these has a label. Well, generally the more alcoholic and the sweeter the wine is, the more that I tend to like them. So all of these points, these might be wines that I know that I like, whereas these, the really bitter and not alcoholic wines, might be the ones that I don't like. And so here we start to see this divide right between the data. You don't even need to test all the various other different wines in order to predict what type of wine I might like in the future. Instead, let's say we choose a point up here, something that is pretty alcoholic and pretty sweet. Well, everything else around it is something that I'd like. So chances are this would be a wine that I would probably like. And on the other hand, if something else is down here, something that's not alcoholic and not that sweet, this is something that I probably wouldn't like. And so a classifier is basically making a bunch of classifications based off the data like this. Our first type of classifier is called a k-nearest neighbors classifier. And what this does is it looks at a given point and checks its nearest k neighbors. So for example, in here, if our k is three, then our new point would look at this one, this one, and this one, the ones around it. It assigns the label of the majority of the surrounding neighbors. So for example, all of these are positive, so I can say that this will most likely be positive. Whereas maybe something is closer to the middle like this. Here we have these two positive points near that line, but we also have this negative down there. However, because we're looking at the k nearest neighbors and we're taking the majority, this would actually come out to a classification of positive because two out of its three nearest neighbors were positive. And that's precisely the logic that I'm gonna use here. Except now, instead of just sweetness and alcohol, we have all these other different factors that this data set has given us. So if we go back to the Jupyter Notebook, we can create a k nearest neighbors classifier and let's feed it a neighbor's value of three. And then we're gonna fit our data to this model by providing the X training data and the Y training data. And so now we have this model and we can make predictions by calling predict and inputting our X test set. And so basically the closer that this output is to our Y test set, the better our model will do. And here what I'm printing is just some accuracy measures. So it seems like this doesn't do that great. It probably has like around a 72, 73% accuracy rate, which is not amazing, but it's not nothing. And then here we're gonna do the exact same thing, but instead of three neighbors, we're gonna use five to see if that does any better. And you'll see that the output is approximately the same. It doesn't do too much better, it doesn't do too much worse. And you might be asking, well, why don't we use like the 100 nearest neighbors? And the reason why we don't use a huge number for neighbors is because the bigger that number is, then the likelier that your radius is bigger and bigger and bigger, and the likelier that there are points that you're considering in your neighbors that have absolutely no relevance to the point that you actually wanna know about. So our next two classification methods are tree classifiers, and these are exactly what they sound like. 
So a decision tree is basically a classifier that tries to split your data over and over again, asking different questions such as, is the sweetness greater than five on a scale of 10? Is the alcohol content greater than 9% alcohol? And based on all these different classifications, it produces a final output, which is a classification that you're looking for. Now, a random forest works somewhat similarly. However, instead of a single decision tree, it's actually multiple decision trees. And all these trees are slightly different because of an element of randomness. It works because in every single decision tree, you have an output of whether it's good, mediocre, or bad. And then at the end, you take the majority of what all of these decision trees have classified. And because it's element of randomness, it typically is more accurate than any individual decision tree. So now going back to the code, let's build both of those. Here we're going to do the exact same thing, but instead of the k-nearest neighbors classifier, we're just going to use the random forest classifier. And you'll see that it comes out to an 80% accuracy, which is significantly better than our previous 72% accuracy. And then the decision tree classifier down here, same thing, but instead of but now we're just changing the classifier to decision tree classifier. And you'll notice that now the accuracy is somewhere around 73%. So clearly right now the random forest classifier is still doing the best out of any of the classifiers that we've seen so far. Our last classifier is the stochastic gradient descent classifier. And stochastic gradient descent is basically attempting to minimize a loss function. What a loss function is, you can think of it as a penalty. So we are trying to minimize the penalty using this classifier. And this penalty might be something that's imposed when we incorrectly classify something. We're trying to minimize this function that basically measures how incorrect we are. Using this classifier, we get an accuracy score of approximately 70%, which means that among these four classifiers that we've used, our winner turns out to be the random forests. So here I'm going to use randomized search CV to see if I can fine tune these parameters and fit our data to a model that gives us an even better accuracy. So essentially I'm just going to come up with all the different possible parameters that we can input into our tree. Things like number of trees in the forest, number of features to consider at every single split, maximum number of levels in the tree, and so on. And what our search is going to do is try to come up with a bunch of different combinations and see if there is any combination that gives us better output than any of the rest. And so here we can see that these are our best parameters for the model. But however, this cross-validation score of 80% is not that much different than our previous score. And so because of that, I'm just going to use our original model to predict different one. And one thing that we have to be careful about random forests is that random forests are very prone to overfit your data, which means that it might generate something that works really, really well on your data, but once you input new data into here that doesn't come from our original data set, it might not be that great. So here now we have this classifier that can tell us with an 80% accuracy rate if our wine is good, mediocre, or bad. One thing that I originally wanted to do in this video was to see if I can find data about Franzia and my favorite $5 Trader Joe's wines and then compare those to like the $1,000 bottles of wines that you see only in like the high-end fancy restaurants and stuff like that. And I wanted to see how the model would classify those in terms of quality. But unfortunately, I kind of realized that the data for the features that you need to input into here tend to be pretty obscure and not that accessible. So I wasn't able to do that, but if you guys ever do, definitely let me know. Um, I would totally 100% be curious to see if $5 and $1,000 wine has any difference in quality probably does. Yeah, I definitely want to see how the model would do in predicting that and recognizing that. So there's a quick introductory machine learning project that you can do in your free time in quarantine. And cheers. Don't worry, it's just water.